Now a lot of the time I go and do my beach fishing throughout the winter. I find the fishing's a bit better then. This is beach fishing, not rock fishing. But there comes a time in every man's life when the weather lures you out, the conditions lure you out. You sort of know it's all against you, but you just got to go. Join me and I'm on the Just Want to Go trips. Well, it is totally awesome fishing time again. I am down here on the beach. I decided to come down. I don't think I've ever come down so late. It is five past five in the afternoon. And I just thought I'd leave it late because it's the back end of summer and there'd be too many people in the water. Go out on a jet ski. Some people have been swimming up there. So I've moved a groin down out of their way. I'm just going to give it a go. And uh, fingers crossed I catch on that. Now then, quite an unusual bait I'm going to be using here. I've got, and I don't know how to put it to you. I got the foreign crabs. I suppose it's treatable, I don't know. You see these things. There it says, foreign peeler crab, donated to me by one of our supporters. And this is half of one of those crabs. I've no idea what I'm gonna catch. I don't normally fish here to the winter. I've got a pulley panel. Let me just crank that up for you guys. Hopefully you can see that swing in there. It's a pulley panel rig. I've got a standard long tail bomb on there and I've just whipped on um, a whole ragworm and half of one of those foreign crabs. And well, I'm going to send it out. Conditions like this is probably, probably a blank, but you know, I'm going to give it a go anyway. So uh, let's whiz this one out there and I'll get the other rods rigged up. And I'm going to put some real small hooks out because I'm coming inside and I think high tide is 10 o'clock at night. And that's what I've come for. The old saying is called be there when they bite. I have absolutely no idea because everybody tells me it's terrible fishing. I just whizzed it out there, forgot to put the camera on it, it was a really good cast because the wind's down and it's a long tail bomb, it makes it to go through the air better. Let's get this fixed up. Okay, for the second rig, I'm using a grip lead. I might actually, when I bring that uh, half crab in, in case there's a big fish around here, I might actually uh, put a grip on because I feel they hook better against it. So I've got a grip lead here, and then I've got just a straight three hook rig here, pattern also, but if you see, they've got a little bead above them and a little miniature attractor swivel. So we're just gonna see what happens here. I don't suppose there's gonna be anything coming out yet, at least until about eight o'clock. So I've got a couple of hours while the tide comes in. And fingers crossed, my hunch at high tide in the dark, is that going to switch us on? Right, let's get this one out. The thing is with the... Um, Things like smooth hounds, they could pick that crab bait up and bolt with it and just not pull the hook in. I feel with the grip length, they could pull the hook in. So if my right hand rod hammers over there and I miss the bite, it's your fault for not making me change from a plain bomb to a grip. I was just tempted to use a plain bomb purely because the wind's down, the sea's flat, it's nice, you cast farther. And of course, if you want to move it, you can bump it, can't you? You can bump it. With a grip lead, you're fixed. The rods are out there. All this set, I bought the spinning rods as well. What I'm gonna do, maybe over in this groin here, because it's gonna flood this way. I can't straight out here and it's already pulled a little bit that way. So next time I, I throw the crab out, I'm gonna put it right in the middle, but there are people swimming up there, so I don't wanna keep a 
get too near to where they are in case they swim in the line. I'll put my other tripod just this side so I can watch both. I'm definitely in this clear water going to just lob some down here because there might be small fish, might be little schooly bass. Who knows? It's one of those that I don't think till that sun goes down I'm probably even going to get a bite. It's looking pretty ominous behind me though. I've got no umbrella, nothing. I could go back to the car, I've got a small umbrella. I hope it doesn't rain. But honestly, just look at this for a setting. Beautiful. And of course the kids have gone back to school, so it's starting to quiet down for us beach fishermen to get out there in a bit of peace and quiet. I haven't been beach fishing for absolutely ages. I don't through the summer, I don't live near the sea, I'm 50 miles from the sea. Tip there guys, pieces of old. Tie it in a tube, stripped up, must be 30, 40 years old, still going strong. Lash it all together with a stretch and I can carry extra rods with me. Mind you, some people might not like it, so I have no problem with scratched or chip rods. I find the fish is too late when they come up here and see, oh goodness, that paint's all chipped. Bit late, isn't it, for the fish? He catches anglers. So all I've got are these spinning rods, because I'd seen the weather as flat, so I've got a couple of... You've seen these, I use them on the boat, I like them boat fishing, I use them cat fishing. They're really pretty strong. I've had them a few years now. There you go, they're just regular nine foot, false nine spinning rods, 2.7, actually is 20 to 60 grams, which you know in grand pull and language means nothing. FS9? I've no idea. I'm lost. Uh, small, almost. Well, they're smaller than some of the guys that go carp fishing use these. These are small ones. These great big pit reels. I've, I've sort of no idea why. These things do me perfectly well. This was Aichi SW5500. So I guess it's the real size is a 5500. I can't remember what I was using this one for, but there is underneath here somewhere some braid so I've topped this off with a nylon I think for catfishing I've got a feeling I must be going catfish or maybe boat fishing you know it's one of those things I don't know why I've done it thank god for butt rings that's the only one I can get through easily and daylight just general talking while I do this the mackerel fishing this year from what I hear has been dire if you had a flood tide in summer, in September, my goodness me, like this, slicking off, then there would be splattering, when I was a kid, Mac would be splattering around there chasing the white bait. Now, well, the water's easily clear enough, but they tell me it's pretty grim. So, here's the ragworm peeps. Nice juicy ragworm. I'm gonna put a big bait on this one. I mean a big bait. If you look at the size of that ragworm, I've got on this one a pulley panel. The panel is two hooks. I fire the hook through his mouth, pop him over the eye, slide him all the way up. I'm certainly going to smell this. Probably just get chewed by the crabs like you do. You just feed, feed the crabs, that's what I'm doing. Slide the free hook down like this and I just put a few turns around it and nick that top hook on. It helps hold the worm out and then on the bottom Peel that, that bit of skin off the back. I'm just gonna whack this crab on and then fold his legs there. He's got quite long legs, these foreign crabs. Fancy me getting the foreign crabs, that's terrible. I haven't even been abroad. Bind it on. They are soft, it says foreign peelers, and they are indeed soft. So this is a lovely bait for rays, smooth hound, bass, conger. It's got to be, look, look, guys, it's got, I'm, I'm well aware it's got to be a big fish to take this, but I figure it's worth chucking one rod out there with a ginormous bait on like this, just to see what's out there. The thing is, I'm sure fish for so long, I'm full of all that renewed hope, you know, which I'm sure will get knocked out of me in a minute. In about two hours when I've had a bite. Let's get it out there. So there you go, I'm all clipped down. I've got a veined grip lead there, which is which is supposed to keep the flight even in the air. 
but I have to tell you when you retrieve they get banged up and bent so if you don't straighten them with a pair of pliers they're lead so you can straighten that vein if you don't straighten them the next cast might wobble a bit and kill your distance so I'm just going to lob this one out there because look how clear the water is now if it's windy I'd have to cast harder anyway but this way yes I want to lob it out it's disengaged it's no problem it's only gone 50 yards but I don't mind like oh, that I don't like the look of that black cloud. See, I've gone on to braid now, so I'm hoping that knot is okay. I must have used a top off there for some reason. I don't even know myself. Don't need that guy going through my uh, line either. Just over there, the guy paddleboarding straight across my lines, but there you go. Oh, don't come back, please. Whole, whole beach to play with. We've all got to play here, though. It's a, that's a big bait, so I'm just checking that can pull off. Right, on this one I'm going to put small hooks. I'm trying everything on this little short, short trip hunch that I've got that the fish flood tide coinciding with the dark might do it. Now, in the 20 minutes I've been here, when I first turned up, it was smooth. Now the wind's picking up. It's coming from the sort of the southeast. I don't know if it's a boy over there or somebody swimming. I've no idea. Right. This one I've got a very small lead here to show you. This is called a silly rig. There's one down and two up, but they're all pretty close together. They're one of Tony's tackle ones. And the reason being is it can't swell. You don't need to clip it down. You can slide these little, I haven't slid my one right down there. These little beads there. It stops a worm going up the line, but I will explain something when I get back in the tackle shack about whether it should clip down or not clip down. I'm just going to lob it out with like, uh, what is that, about three ounce lead. A grip though. 40, 50 yards, that's all I need. I'm looking for birds, there are birds up there, people have gone from swimming, but I bet, I bet the mackerel will come up at the last minute and I haven't got a spinning rod. Oh, that would be a second. Small hooks on that that rig there and again little taps on there so I'm pretty sure I'm going to get crabbed out of sight I'm aiming to fish into the dark for two hours just to see what's there I might have to go back to the car and get my uh, chair and an umbrella just in case just nice to be out on the beach so I'll tell you what's nice to tie up two baits and because I haven't done it that much this year, lose the thread again. And forget the, the cooler for the crabs again. Oh well, they'll be used. Always, always put the thread where you know it is. Put the knife where you know it is. Put the rag where you know it is. Cover the worms over so they don't get cooked in the sun. Best to put them in a, in a little cool bag. I'm going to check the time and give it about half an hour. It is 20 to 6. I'm going to give it a 6 o'clock. Come in if I've got bare hooks. I'm going to be struggling to keep all these baits out there if there's that many crabs. I can't see any other anglers whatsoever. I'm looking up and down. Noisy stick ups of rods up on the beach. There's nothing. Friday night, you'd think there would be. I mean, generally. May and, and sort of June are the two peak months for smooth hounds down here, but do not neglect to put some gravel around the bases or dig them in the shingle at the back, and just in case, because I've been boat fishing out there, and I've been out for a long time, but when I used to, September was one of the best times for the big um, smooth hounds uh, in the boat, in the boat, that is. shore fishing, I couldn't tell you, but you never know, if you've got crab out there, then there's a chance an outside freaky chance that one of these rods could go over with a crab on it. I think I'm going to whiz back to the car and just get the chair and the tripod and the floodlight. Didn't bring the umbrella, I can't believe it. I'll tell you guys, that forecast had better be right. I'm knocking on his door if I get soaked. Well, trudge back to the car, got the tripod for the lighter jacket in case it gets cold. The luxury carp chair that's been stitched many times. But, oh, 
is light to carry and easy for me to sit in. Gives the poor old legs a bit of a break. Looks like that sky which could go stormy. And I think they're small tides. Small tides are neap tides. They don't have much movement in and out. So there's not much food being rolled up in and out. So the fish that are there are there. They're either there or they're not there. Whereas if you've got it all stirred up and churned up, they're pretty sure to be there, you know, at any state of tide. I'm hoping high water in the dark. Time for something to eat. Ragworm sandwich. Well, the trouble is, when you don't get bites, you end up going through the old food bag, don't you? And that's when you realise, oh my God, I've got to get till 10 o'clock tonight and I've only got one roll left. And worse, the wife put tuna in it. That's sort of rubbing salt in the wound to a fisherman. A nice cob of bread. I do like a piece of gnawing bread. I've had a bite on that left-hand spinning rod. Struck. Nothing, but 100% a bite, rattle, rattling bite. So I've, I've left it there, because it's the one with a small grip lead, so I've left it out there. Big grip leads, I couldn't do that, you know, I'd have to pull it all the way in. And that one I'm just going to leave there, see if anything comes back. We're going to have this, and then I'm going to have to check that big bait, which has been out probably 45 minutes. Hopefully it's not been stripped by the crabs. It's just nice to see that a couple of, oh she's falling in, paddleboard and they blow up paddleboards. I've never seen an inflatable paddleboard. They blew them up with a pump from the car, left the car engine running. Guy with the boat's coming in really shallow there. Okay, he's not in front of me in the background. Another guy with a jet ski is trying to tow, I guess, uh, somebody else on a, on a, what do they call those balls they drag behind the boat. I've had a good whack down on that roll on my left. I'm tempted to wind that in before I wind the big one in. It's just nice to see, look at the sun coming through the clouds. Just need a fish. Everybody else is enjoying themselves except me. They've got their boats and their blow up whatevers. I've got no blow up anything, I've got nothing. I might have something on this though. Dab. Or nothing. Wow, this kitty needs some oil. Oh dear. Well, I have a hell of a bite. I'm going to put it down as a black bream. I haven't caught anything, but I, I think these baits might be stripped, one or two. Just wind in here. A little bit of weed there that I have. Well, no, to tell a lie, guys. It's just that one. There's the one, that hook there. At the top is the strip one. That one's okay, that one's okay. Well, that does surprise me. I thought they would be stripped with crabs. Right. I'm sort of more enthusiastic for the dark now because I have got some worms to use. At least, you know, the crabs aren't going to be noshing on them. Right, let's whiz this one out. A couple of people out walking their dogs and stuff. I mean, it's, it is a superb evening. Can't grumble, but you know what fishermen are like. We only want one thing. Ooh, and that's fish. I'm hopeful. I don't care how small it is, I am hopeful. I had two good bites. I'm pretty sure the second one was a black bream. Thing is, this trip is just so last minute. I planned to go down west to Chesil Beach at Abbotsbury. Phoned up, the guy said, everything's there except, and I know that the fact, look, it's a tackle shop, they're gonna tell you everything, aren't they? You know, how wonderful everything is. God, I don't wanna get that. I can get past that groin, hopefully. Let's put it back this way. Tide's taking it in there a bit. Yeah, so that wasn't right, you know, because I said, how many mackerel? Well, none. Okay, I'll go up to Weymouth. Uh, no, not much up there. Nothing there. I thought, well, I'll come back. I'll go to Milford Shingle. No, didn't fancy that one. I just kept coming back and back and back. And because as I came back, the tide that I had read as say five o'clock down the west coast, uh, you know, further west. As I came east was later and later and later. Ooh. Well, something hit me on the way in then. That was bizarre, to say the least. Look how clear that water is. Oh my God, my baits barely touched. That is barely touched. Obviously a little bit of weed there. I'm certainly not going to run out of bait. 
clip that down and send it out again. Yeah, so I've ended up here, because I thought, this is like hour and 20 down the road for me. So I thought, well, that'll do. If I'm going to blank, I might as well blank. And of course, the big thing is down west, Weymouth, further west again, eight pounds for a parking ticket, eight pounds. Uh, thanks, but I won't be coming your way. I think that's ridiculous. Greedy, greedy, greedy. What's I going to do with this guy? Tell me where I'm supposed to be casting. I thought I'm casting too far left. I might give this one a bit of a wallop. Oh, that one went. That's on the other white. Gosh. Hope that disengaged. That was a good one. Yeah, so I'll come back to what is known as trusty old Hailing Island where I catch normally not very much at all. As a kid, I did. Don't get me wrong, as a kid, I did. Why is that rod straight? Should have a slight tension in it. Well, I think I can afford to leave my baits out a bit longer now. That's two baits. Why are there crabs? Now, if there's no crabs, are there no fish? You start worrying, don't you? And it's pretty up there with that cloud like that against those rods. You know, if one of the rods bent over. Yeah, so it's a sort of last minute, just go fishing type of trip. And, you know, the fact there's no anglers out here on a Friday night does tell me. I mean, if I don't do any good tonight, I probably won't be beach fishing till the winter. I'll wait till like November when there's chance of stuff coming in. No cook ups, not going to do a cook up, can't be bothered to do a cook up, just going to do uh, sandwiches in a flask. I really can't be bothered to do it. It's still nice to come down and just hear the sound of the waves. No wind howling in the mic. See if, I, see, if I, see if I can get a booty. I don't get why flat calm like this, evening flood tide, when it's clear still, and we've had a settled spell for probably 10 days now, so the water's clear, the small little fish like this should be in there, and the predators, bass and mackerel should be after them. Traditionally, when it's like this, there should be birds working out there, shoals of mackerel going through. So I sort of don't, I don't get really, we cannot surely, when I say we, I refer to the commercials who catch metric tons of the spawn field mackerel. I don't get how you could even decimate the mackerel to that extent. It's painfully obvious, it looks like they have. And that's not just me bitching and moaning, go and ask plenty of other anglers. Of course, you will get one guy who says, I call 50 mackerel. Yeah, but a lot of other people have had one, none, two, you know. If you're lucky, you're lucky, but the majority, they tell me, are struggling. The times they are changing. Still, we will run out of fuel in a minute, that guy. The daylight will push him down, I guess. And then I really will have peace and quiet. I wonder if all that droning noise is putting fish off. What do, what do you think? I mean, it, it, it's not beneficial, it's certainly not going to attract them, but making a hell of a noise up and down there. I wonder if that does put the fish off. Not long before he packs up and goes home. Well, I better give you guys uh, an update. Absolutely nothing has happened. At least I had two bites on that left hand one early doors. Other than that, nothing. The worms are coming in even better than when they went out. They're coming wrapped up and put in a packet again. People have put all their toys away. And over there, and that's going down, the gentleman's turned up. I think he's just with his wife chilling out in the evening and he's, he's thrown a couple of rods out. So I have got a sort of fishing company there. There's quite a bit of tide. That boat anchored over there in the end, after sort of great deliberation. 
if he realises he's got to put enough anchor rope out for the tide coming up, like lift up, drifts his anchor, lifts his anchor off the deck because it's so shallow there as the tide lifts the boat and he drifts off into the wild blue yonder. He probably end up in Barbados or somewhere. Yeah, I can see the tide line over those breakers over there. You know, the wind break, uh, the uh, surf break here, wave break. It's just bizarre. There is not a thing moving at all. Now, in the winter, you would expect whiting to come in about now, about now. I've got two hours before high water, just a little bit over two hours. I guess it's being a small tide, spring tide's up here. A small tide, the top of the tide's only just here, you see, that's the trouble. I doubt it'll come over there. I might have to move back to here. There's no wind to push it up either. So I figure my bait might last out, but it is very, very quiet. Unbelievably black across there, but I think that's just a sort of night cloud, what we call a night cloud. A pleasant enough evening, but I need a rod rattle. Well, people, it's not happening. Let's turn this light out. It's not happening. Lots of motionless. It's 25 to 11 at night. I haven't seen anything come off the beach at the other end, so I'm going to call it quits. It is what it is. It's one of those things called, yes, a blank. Can't be helped. It's the way it is. I've given it a go. I thought I would use that old saying, be there when they bite. I am there and they ain't biting. It's the way it is. I've never known it as dead down here. I don't get many beach blanks, but down here seems to be my special place for it. Uh, what I'm going to do, pack up now. Got to get home. I don't see any point. I've waited till the top of the tide, which was 10. It's now 25 to 11, so it's on the way down, which is one of my favourite times. And it's just not happening. It's the way it is. Really good fresh bait, and it hasn't worked out. When we get back, let me have a few hours sleep, and tomorrow, I'm going to show you exactly what I think the difference is between clip down baits and not clipping down baits and what you should do with your worms. I've got a few worms left, I'll show you how I hook them up. Anyway guys, I'm off to Bubby Loo land, have a little sleep and see you guys in the morning. Well that wasn't the world's most fantastic fishing trip was it? A blank. But I'm back here in the tackle shack, I just want to run through something which is it's been on my mind for beginners for some time because they're going to talk to people that want to do big casting, big casting, big casting. They want to clip bait, clip bait, clip bait. That's when you clip your bait down so you can get a bit of extra distance. But it, it's not always like that. It's not always like that. And if you want to catch fish generally, I'm talking on the south coast of Britain, indeed, any beach environment is not all about clip baits. You know, clip baits are generally for bigger baits, bigger fish. If you're a beginner or a novice, you want to catch just anything. That's me last night. If you want to catch anything, just a regular three-hook paternoster, what we call a flapper, or variations of that, is really all you need. But of course, I can see how people are going to go, but I can't cast so far because I need to clip my bait down. Let me try and explain to you what happens to the worm and why you don't I believe, have to clip down all the time. I'm going to be using, just to start with, the regular pulley rig, which is a big fish rig, you know, it comes under the category of, you're, you know, if you're using a pulley rig, you're generally after something pretty decent. So it's got a single hook. It might be difficult to do this without actually having a rod here. I'll do my best anyway. Bear with me. So. This would normally be tied, this bead here, from the top of your fishing line, you tie it there. Okay, now you've got your lead here, there's your lead, right? The other lead is a little bit shorter than the distance of the bead to the lead because it's got a clip there. Okay, so you would generally, let's say, use a giant worm or a load of black lug on there. Okay, so you're going to clip it down like this. I'll bring the camera in close up in a minute. It's going to be clipped down 
So it looks like this. Now, here's where I'm going to bring the camera in closer. Hopefully you guys are going to see this here, get it in the frame. So there is your bait, it's clipped down. When this impacts with the water, it will pop this hook off there, like that. It falls free. So, let's just imagine, now this is your worm. I'm going to cut it down. I'm going to cut this down. Now, yes, use your imagination. There are not too many pink worms around. Okay, I'm going to wet my hook here because this is plastic in my, I might not work. Right, you put your hook into, let's say, the head of the ragworm or the lugworm. If I keep that hook shank fairly wet, it should work, it should work. So, I'm going to thread it up the hook like I would do a normal bait, okay? Now, this is obviously very, very tight. I'm going to work it around. I hope this is just be a way of showing you the idea. Now, there's a tag end on that, which I'm going to snip off. So I've been using fish baits and I want to illustrate it with a worm bait there. You pop your worm over like this. I tend to get a, a load of meat behind the back and it go pop, just like that rubber has, okay? So there it is. It's going to be, you bait it up. You're going to clip it down into your bait clip, bait release clip like this. Now you're going to cast it out. Now what happens is this. Let me just pull that camera back. You make your cast. Here we go. Whoosh, it goes out. The lead. Again, use your imagination, please. Smith, keep quiet. You go like this, ready? You go, whoosh. And it's, imagine it's going through the air like this. With an incredible amount of casting power, this worm gets blasted up the line, like this, it comes up the line, okay? So what they do is, they put generally something like sequins on, and we used to use, you can get proper bait stops in the tackle shop, I get a piece of wire, you cut it, you shred the outer casing off it, might take you a couple of goes to get it. We used to use, and it was standard years ago, because that's all we had, people use telephone wire as the stop to stop the worm. It's a worm stop because you do not want that worm blasting up the line on the cast. Now, you get that on a clip down. So what you would do is put your sequin up here. I'll do it. Do you know what? It might be easier if I do it on a piece of this line. So ordinarily you'd tie your hook on, wouldn't you? Easy peasy. What you can do now is to put sequins on there, depending on the size. You can generally buy them in sea fishing shops. These were stolen off one of my wife's dresses, she doesn't yet know. And thread a sequin on there. Just like this. Now you can put several on there. You can use different coloured ones. You can get them from dress shops. They give a bit of flash as well in the water for clear water daytime fishing. But the main thing is they act as a sort of rigid bait stop. I'll put these on and I'll show you. So I've got them like that, okay? Just there. Now I'm going to tie my hook on. So I've got my worm threaded up the hook. Here's the hook point. I threaded it all the way up the trace. I've got my sequins there, okay? And then you can use smaller rubber bands if you want, or you can use a few fibers, just like we used to years ago. We used telephone wire, just grab a, a little pinch of fibers copper wire, that's all I'm using, twist it up, it's all for beach fishing this, don't really use it for uh, boat fishing or I guess you could use it up tiding, just roll those, you might get a, a piece that's the right diameter but I'm just using that now, all you do is, if you can see this, worm, sequins and above that, I leave about half inch over there, there's my trace, I'm just binding that quite tightly. Side touching turns as best you can. It doesn't look like I'm pulling it tight, but I'm, I'm trying to tie this, look at the monitor, get it all done in one. So, as I say, we used telephone wire years ago, and it was coloured as well, we always used to like colour telephone wire. Right, 
snip that off. Snip the other tag end off. Hopefully you guys can see all this. I won't zoom in too much. Now then, this is then this piece of copper, adjustable, look, under tension, look, they're tight, you can slide it with your nail. Now, if I go back a bit with that, that's probably better. There's my worm, there's my sequin, and use a sequin, it's about the sort of same diameter as a ragworm or lugworm head, but the sequin won't come flying up the trace, will it? Because it's stopped by the, by the um, copper sleeve here, just where it's whipped on. If I want to move it, I just hold the bend of the hook here. If I have a longer worm, or I want to put a load of worms up there. I just slide that up, look, the sequins are loose, and I can bring that worm right up to here. See, if you, if you cast with a clip-down rig, that worm, the tendency, because it's going this direction, the air pressure is being wanting to push this worm up over the eye of the hook, off the shank, all the way up the line. It sits up the line here somewhere, the hook's down here, the fish takes the bait up here, and there's no hook in it. So the idea of using this with a clip-down rig like this, you can go and buy them if you want, I've just done exactly the same, same thing that you would do in the shop, like that. However, if you use a three-hook paternoster rig, uh, you see, if you use, which is what beginners would want to use, three small hooks, look, this one's called a silly rig, by the way. Um, hook down by the lead here, one here, one up higher, and here you tie this end, right? Now this, you don't clip down. Some people do make clips, you know, to work with this rig, but generally you've got three loose hooks. You might have them this long. This is a very long trace. This is 15 inches long. This one. Let's say you only want six inches, which is what I probably use a lot of the time. You don't clip it down, okay? So the problem that happens is when you cast like this, there's an exit, whizz, it goes out, right? These will then go all the way back down. They're flying through the air, these hooks. But the air pressure is pushing the worm the exact, exact opposite way than you would have the clip down bait. So you can have a similar sort of problem, but at the other end of the scale. Let me show you. Here's that, here's that worm rig made up, okay? You think, well, that should be okay. Well, no, because you're casting the other way. As the lead goes up this direction here, these, these snoods are, will spin around the opposite direction, okay? They'll be dragging behind the hook in the air, and what happens, a lot of you are probably nodding, thinking, oh, I know what happens, it all goes down like this. Look, I can even do it with this rubber, rubber one. It all goes down into an awful gobby mess on the bend of the hook. Just a gobby mess. And, you know, it will slow up your casting through the air. It doesn't look good. Most worms don't look to a fish to be in a blobby mess like that. So you could still use your sequins if you want. They will get pushed down this way. But... The object of the exercise is to keep that worm straight. It's the same principle. All baits for casting need to be straight, really. You'll get more distance. So I'm going to bait that as to how I would have it normally. All for beginners, all for beginners. Advanced people, oh, move along. You won't learn anything off of me. Beginners might be able to help one or two catch a few, few extra fish. So you can leave these sequins on if you want. You can even leave the stop up here if you want. But what's going to happen, this is going to want to slide back down this way. So then what I tend to do with worms on a three hook flapper rig is get yourself some bait thread. Tricky to do again. So I've got all this gear in front of me. Let's go and do about 10 tight turns, 12, around the line. Get hold of the head of the worm here and just in front of the head of the worm, bind it but not so tight that you cut through it, if that makes sense. And then, you know, I, some people just snap it. I tend to do just like an overhand loop like this. I'll go through the loop, like a half hitch, pull it up. Now you do that on all three hooks. Just cinch it down a little bit tighter, pop it off. Now, it looks the same, doesn't it? 
because it's, it's going to stop that worm getting blasted down to the bend of the hook. It just, it just holds it up there straighter. And because the wind will actually push these down, these uh, sequins, and you can still, if you want, slide your copper wire strip down like that. So you've got a bit of flash there in front of the, uh, in front of the worm. So there's two different ways. If it's a loose three hook unclipped flapper rig, a paternoster rig, I suggest straighten the worm out over the shank of the hook. You can even whip, if you've got a little tag end here on the hook, you can whip, whip either side of that if you're using small baits there. I've put obviously what I consider to be a whole, a whole size worm on there. And then just whip with elasticated thread there. Don't worry if it's not too neat, it doesn't matter the fish, you know, are still gonna take it. And that way, it doesn't get blasted down in a gobby mess. Now, that wasn't the reason <laughs> that I blanked last night. There was just no fish there. Uh, it's just the way it is. But if you do follow that basic procedure, if you want to clip down, if you're a beginner, novice, starter, just coming back into the sport, you've read about clip down baits. If you want to clip the worm down for long distance casting, by all means clip it down, but use a sequin and the little copper wire or any sort of bait stock. You can buy them in tackle shops if you want to buy them. These cost me nothing. The sequins cost me nothing. Equally, if you are a real beginner and you're obviously going to use small hooks, small baits like half worm sizes, something like that, you just want to catch something. I was fishing with that rig last night, it did me no good, but I thought it was worth mentioning that to stop it going down, because if you think about it, the worm pressure, if it's unclipped, the leg goes first, the trace comes back this way, it's dragged through the air, and then all the pressure comes off the eye of the hook into the bend of the hook and pushes it down in a gobby mess. Loads of you have probably gone, I wonder if that's why I didn't catch anything. Look, it's just tips from old school. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Now, what can I show you guys to keep you interested still? I'll probably put up, I know, I've got a pike rig that was shown to me by Alex from Saxon Mill Fishery. Let's check that one out. Okay, we're here with uh, Alex at Saxon uh, Mill Fishery, and he's just gonna run through because he's into predator fishing and come up with a, perhaps a different rig for you guys, even for beginners. You can always adapt, always change. Don't think because it's in a book, it's definitely the only way. There are other ways, aren't there, Alex? Too right there is, yeah. So uh, the main mechanics of the rig is just a simple floated ledger rig. So we have a sliding uh, Zeppelin style float, which runs up the line up to a stop knot, which is tied on there. Uh, I have seen a few people in the past using small pieces of split shot and things like that but what you run the risk of is if you're fishing especially deep of reeling that through your rod rings and breaking the ceramics on your nice fancy rods. So I just do a simple just stop knot with a piece of braid, never elastic or anything like that. Just something nice and simple. I think one of my, I think there's other rods just beep. gone. I heard a single beat. The float's gone under there. Let's have a look. <clears throat> ah, now she's back up. Nope. Popped up, she yeah. She's back up. Right, pause and reset. <clears throat> So this is for pike and or zander? Pike, zander, to be honest, any predatory rig really. Um, you can use it in a multitude of ways. So the top half of it is all pretty pretty standard, just a floated ledger rig, running down to the smallest ledge you can get away with, with a big run ring on it, something with less resistance as possible. Just going to a stopper there, so nothing gets tangled up over your swivel, yep. just ensures a nice clean cast. Now the important bit is the business end, obviously using a, a wire trace. One thing I've found in the past um, buying wire traces is that they're all crimped and the hooks are crimped onto them. Um, what I've found is that as soon as a hook point rolls over when you get stuck in a snag or if you need to change your hook sizes or if you want to change over from you know, a dead bait rig with two trebles on it um, and then down to a single hook for maybe a circle hook for a zander on a smaller bait you have to buy a whole new rig you have to throw away this if this gets a bad kink in it or anything like that you have to throw the lot away and start again and I'm, I absolutely detest waste so what I've done is just slightly modified uh, these traces that I make myself so what we have here is 40 pound Fox Rage, um, just crimped onto a Catmaster 80 pound split ring. Uh, so these are the same split rings that you'll find in, um, you know, in your lure fishing. So they're, they're plenty strong enough, rated to 80 pounds, and they're designed to have a hook attached to them. So you know, designed to be pulled at all funny angles and really snatch that hard. Um, and then what that allows you to do, of course, is to change your hooks over. So when the hook point rolls over, if you bend a hook straight, or if you just want to change your hook size, you can just get your snap lock pliers in there, take a hook off and change it back over. What it also allows you to do is take off what I've made of these little boom sections, which is just a short piece of trace with a split ring and a hook on one end. And if I need to switch over from a live bait, and when, well, when the live bait eventually dies and turns into a dead bait, you can just snap on an extra hook, clip it onto this ring here, 
and there you go you've just changed over from a single hook rig to a double uh, trebled rig or you can put a circle hook on one end and a treble on the other I mean, you could even put a lure on it if you really. I can see that so, with, the, with the split rings, yeah. Yeah, you could just snap on whatever you need. Take the hooks off. So it's, just, it's kind yeah. of like it's, it's it's a modular rig really to save having That's to buy idea, five, yeah. six sets yeah. of every different type of rig imaginable. You've just got one. Well, I take two traces with me now, and then an assortment of hooks and booms and things like that. So if there's zander in the swim or very big perch, I can drop down to a nice small hook. The big pike around, I'll put double trebles on. Um, and of course you can make these all different lengths so you can go from fishing a sprat this small or you can make a really long one and fish a great big section of bluey or mackerel or sardine and you put some cuts in it a little bit of smell out I guess. oh of course yeah so once they you know once you're using a dead bait um, very little will start to leach out them until they have their first couple of hits on them uh, you know if an eel comes along and stirs it up you know that lets out a lot of sense into what's what i do I just take my baiting scissors just put some snips into the belly let all of that goodness out in the water and um, usually it's a good way to sort of encourage a bite, especially in this heat, um, when they're not too enticed by the flapping around. It looks a bit too energetic for them. They see a nice little pile of dead fish with all the smell and guts leaking out of it. And um, it's usually a, usually a pretty solid way to get a bite on a tough day. Yeah, good tip there. Thanks for that, Alex. Appreciate it. Oh, no worries, man. Well, handy tip there from Alex. I'm also going to go down with the wife down to what they call, I think it's called the Millennium Pier in Gospel. I'm furious I couldn't catch fish last night. Gotta catch something. I'm gonna be using a pen rod and an LRF light rock fishing. Is it light rock? Well, oh my god, they'll crucify me, there's no rocks involved. It's a pier, a very light rod versus the pen rod. Well, it's basically the wife versus me. Oh, yeah, gotta get a deck chair as well. Golly, I hope it don't rain. Come down with some mini sticks. I've got pen rod versus LRF, and I've got the backup of having the wife as well sitting up here in a deck chair. I wonder if I can get her fishing. Over there you can see is the spinnaker tower. My rod had dropped in. It's been at 10 seconds. There's already a fish on it. It's going to be a small fish. It's a small fish all the way here. So I'm going to salvage something out of this. Actually there it looks just like the old fashioned uh, motor torpedo boat. That does not that one. So let's see what we got on the end. It's only going to be small fish but it doesn't matter. It's, at least it's something. So I've got those leftover ragworm. I've got my freshwater reel, five, six pound line. The rod, so you know, is an LRF, it's called a Rockstar 7.5, light rock fishing, I think they say there, 2 to 12, whatever's. I've dropped it down and I've got a fish, literally, straight away. I say it's going to be something like a small pouting. There we go, it is indeed, save the blank, a small pouting, but I've got very small hooks, I'll tell you in a minute. These make excellent bait for uh, bass that live around here as well. Yeah, the tide is going from up here where that big aircraft carrier is coming back under the current. The current's going here, so I feel the fish could be this side close in straight down. So we're going to try this one. What I've got is just two small hooks there, freshwater hooks. That one's not very good. And it's just a fun thing. You can come down, park your car, if you can find a car park space. Bits of ragworm, tiny piece segments of ragworm. The bait. It's, it's got to be what, half an inch long. I'm just using an old sort of nut thing there. I'm going to drop that straight down. It's quite deep. You don't need great big heavy line. I think the secret is small hooks, light line, and a very light rod for the bites. And if I hold that rod, I can tell through my fingers here by touch ledger they're on it already. Look, look, look. You see the rod? That's why they call it LIS so you can see the bites. Here's a fish, another one coming. Well, this is certainly faster than the other night. I know they're only really tiny fish. And you can move around the pier, catching different species. I mean, if you were bass fishing, you would absolutely pay a pound each for those. You can use bits of lugworm as well. I'm going to keep these, well, they're not going to last long in the sun. I'll show you the hooks. It doesn't matter whether you use a long drop or a short drop. It really doesn't matter on the snood. That's probably about a size six, I should think. Maybe that freshwater hook. Tiny segment of worm like that and just drop it down. I should actually keep those in the shade. Two nil. With the weight at the bottom of a pattern, also you can let it go straight down fast maximize your fishing time that the straight on it guys probably going to lose some gear now and then 
just hold that rod top, you might be able to see the bites and wait till they just pull down. Sometimes you can drop right back tighter to the structure down there and pick up a different species ras just by moving it a few feet. The width of that aircraft carrier is amazing. Let's try that. I'm a little bit closer to the uh, structure there. There's the bite. And I can feel it through my fingers here as well as see it on the rod top. A bit like quiver tipping in the uh, freshwater. And if you lose gear, which you're bound to sooner or later, I just lo lose the nut and uh, the hooks. A lot of sand in out there. Oh, that was a better point. Chance of a small back bream here, they're mostly all going to be small. And if you fished at night with a live fish out here, you've got a better chance of bass. There's a better fish. Oh, that's much better. Probably four inches long. I've got this down as a different species. And it is, in fact, a wrasse. There you go. And that was just by casting a little bit closer. Casting a little bit closer to the structure. They're going to be closer rather than further out. Straight off the hook and they go back. It's another wrasse. You can, you can probably catch these most of the day. I don't think they get really big ones here. But it's all, all a bit of fun. And you can just... You can just catch them, throw them back. That was another pouting. Sometimes with two hooks, you can actually get two at once. Hold the camera down still, you might be able to see just down there. I'm having a coffee break here, by the way. All the small fish, and that's the ones that the mackerel are chase. They're actually small fish. I thought they were sandals, but they're very, very small fish. Occasionally you just see them like a white bait flashing. Look at that. Sandwiches. It might be a small immature mullet. So I've got the same rig here, just two hook pad and also rag with a nut. This is the pen rod which extends down there, you can see it extended. Tiny little reel. You need to put silicon on the uh, drags. See if we can catch a fish on a pen rod. I should have put a lighter line on there but I can't be bothered, I just try it. I feel like it's on the bottom. Hopefully, the aircraft carrier is going to come right past the spinnaker tower here, and we should be hopefully in a good place. I'm getting bites. We've got a fish on the pen rod here, I think. This is off. Drag is slipping, and indeed, just another small wrasse. So plenty of these all day, all day long. Just have a throw out with a pen rod. We'll try a little bit farther out, see what's out there. Different species, guys. There's a whitehead. That's just casting out a little bit farther. Whether there's sort of sand out there, I don't know. Even on a little p good sign that the uh, autumn is just around the corner. I'm double rodding now. The, the pen rod's going crazy. Yeah, we're on the pen rod. Spinnaker in the background. 
probably, I don't think it's going to be a wrasse. The drag's a bit sticky. Where is that? It's a bit bigger whitehead. This one's just sort of hooked in the side. How that's happened, I don't know. So I've now caught more fish than I had in six hours. Probably another white in, might even be too white in. Well, I see how the two rods, the LRF quiver tip is way better for bite detection. A double whammy coming up. There we go, guys. It's two at a time. Camera a bit closer. Hopefully, you can see those bites. Well, that, to me, that's rats when they do that, when they tug down sharp bites. And the quiver tip right here motionless for the moment. There's the bite there. Okay I'm pausing because down there guys I've got a fish. It's either a small gurnard or it could be a weaver. Let's bring him down there. Or is that a weaver? What's that one guys? Anybody know? So generally the painful spines are just on the back here, there, I think. So I won't be screwing around with them. That one, we'll let go as he is. You see, everybody back here is pretty much, they've all got a camera. The gentleman's there, looks like he might be snagged up where he's pulling the anchor to this massive, huge... It's got a nice aerial on it. Wayne, is that one of your aerials up the top there? Looks like one of the old... One of the old Wayne's aerials up there. And that's a launching ramp at the front that you can see. It's going to come right past the Spinnaker Tower. And I'll get the ultimate shot of my rod, rod in the picture with the Spinnaker Tower. And, the, and I think that might be the biggest warship we've got coming out there. Just pure lucky, we had no idea. The old SAS or whatever have gone up there. All in black, they're all in black and rubber boats with their sirens blazing. Police boats here. You've got the tugboat there, you see the rope going from the tugboat, but I imagine they're under power as well. Then there's another police boat here on the inside, police boat on the outside. One, two, three, four other big tugboats behind for manoeuvring. And obviously they got, if you can see that up there, they've got their radar aerial going. Yeah, that's true, two guys with a machine gun up there, look. Nobody moved, nobody breathed. The last time I was out with Wayne fishing in a boat, we got too close to it out by uh, the NAB Tower. And the uh, powers that be in the boats with the guns came over about eight handed and advised us to move fairly qu quickly out of the way. I'm getting bites by the way. So there's a Spinnaker Tower. What a shot that. This is little and large. The Spinnaker Tower, the pen rod. Oh my God, he's had one of Mike's curries. I don't know how long it is. I'm going to say 400 yards long. Well, there you go, guys. A little bit of action on LRF and uh, Penrod. Catching loads of small fish there. Time to go and have some lunch. I sort of salvaged something. And it's worthwhile just seeing that huge aircraft carrier. Let's see if I can find something else to tack on here as well. Of interest to you guys. I'm guessing they're all over four pounds. Some of them might run five, like that one there that front one and I think they go up and down here obviously feeding on the algae and the weed but also you know when you look I guess there are people like me that come down with pieces of bread and you can see them coming down on the inside here always makes you want to feel as though you're on holiday doesn't it in here I think I'm in Spain or Portugal nice sunny day that second one's a big fish that one there is big guys that's a five, that's a five though. I'd say it goes five pounds. Oh well, no fishing allowed. Wonder how many times these boats go out, probably the same as mine, I guess. There's a lot of time people just come down. 
and spend the week on them, weekend on them, and just eat in the restaurants, which is kind of crazy if you don't take them out to sea. And then if you wanted a des res, I would imagine some of these flats have got fabulous views over the marina, and possibly not cheap, but a nice place to be. That one down there is a bass. I don't think that's a mullet there. There he goes, it's a bass. Yes, I really would like to have landed one of those mullet on my 13 foot match rod, but it would probably have led me to 17 years in prison. You know what it's like in those marinas. No fishing, no fishing, no fishing, everywhere. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this one. There's some good tips in there, especially about those worms. Don't forget that, especially beginners. Might just help out a little bit. We'll see you in the next one. Fingers crossed. It's a bit easier than that last one was. See you next time.